Coming up on MotorWeek, Glenda Mackay test drives the awesome Renault Clio V6. Richard Hammond gets behind the wheel of the all-new, um, you'll have to watch to find out. Chris Goffey will he'll be driving the latest offering from the luxury car manufacturer Lexus, and Ian Royal's used car item focuses on the Vauxhall Cavalier. Now to most of us, me included, the Renault Clio is a lovely little French shopping trolley. It's a perfect runaround accompaniment to his Beamer parked on the gravel drive. So when Richard Hammond was invited to the launch of the Renault Clio Sport V6 last year, to be honest, I didn't really care. I mean, the kit on this car looks a bit like it's from a Star Wars film. And believe it or not, there isn't even a back seat. The lovely little runaround engine has been replaced by some throbbing great V6. And as far as the exhaust pipes go, well, they look faintly ridiculous. <laughs> now, to be honest, I wouldn't want to be seen dead driving around in a car like this. I was absolutely gutted when old Tricky Dicky beat me to the launch. But whereas he got to drive the car for half an hour, I get to drive it all day. So watch and weep, Mr Hammond. For those of you who think that this is just a Clio Sport with silicon implants, then you're sadly mistaken. For a starters, this car is rear wheel drive, not front wheel drive. And the engine is mid-mounted, which means that you've got no space for your mates in the back. But with a car this good, it needs mates. So what does a mid-mounted engine in a car this size do? Well, for starters, it means that the handling is superb. The Renault 172 was good, but this takes it a stage further. Wheel response is instant, and you can go crazy speeds around those fast little corners without any of your neighbours' feel. Performance figures on the V6 are as impressive as the ride. The engine pumps out a stomping 230 brake horsepower with 0-60 coming up in 6.4 seconds and giving you a top speed of 150 miles an hour. an unbiased motoring programme, I guess we'd better find something about the car that we don't like. Well, being picky, I suppose the interior could be a little bit more high-tech for my liking. It's basically the same as a regular Clio, but with sports steering wheel and racing seats and pedals. But let's not forget, you're getting a limited edition V6 sports car for only 26 grand. So I guess we're going to have to draw the line somewhere. And that's about it for dislikes. Now I've got you all drooling over this car and licking the screen. Before you get too excited, let me just tell you that Renault are only planning to bring about 400 of these into the country this year, and there's already a waiting list for over 500. So it looks like for most of you that it's going to be quite a long time before you get to drive this car. Oh well. Never mind, eh? Agricultural machinery. It would be a bit rude to call most modern 4x4s four that, but that's how they started. But we know they've come on a long way since then. And the tape, well, I thought I'd try something a bit different. You may already know what this car is. If you do, suspend that belief. If you don't, excellent, because we're not going to judge it by the badge on the front or the name. We're going to judge it just by the car itself. We're going to look at how much metal you get for your money, what it does, and how good it is at doing it. No badges. And no peaking.
if our 4 before is an unfamiliar sight to you, that's because it's the first ever foray into the 4 before market for this particular manufacturer. And for their first try to 4 before, they've gone large. It's actually substantially wider and longer than a Land Rover Freelander, and they reckon we'll be competing in the Grand Cherokee bracket, though not when it comes to price. Now don't get all excited, because this isn't going to be some huge surprise. When I whip the tape off the badge, it's not going to be, <gasps> no, it's not one of those. That's not the point of it. In fact, the point of it is that the badge really doesn't matter. We're trying for once just to look at a car and forget what badge it wears. We're going to try anyway. The 2.4 litre petrol and 2 litre diesel engines will both have a manual gearbox, but the 2.7 litre V6 will be mated to an H-Tronic automatic gearbox. Developed in conjunction with Porsche, ooh, it offers both manual and automatic in one. In other words, you can select the gears through an automatic gearbox. Even on these fiendishly twisty, devious Spanish roads, the thing actually handles itself really, really well. Considering what a big, tall car it is, body roll isn't too bad. The suspension, though, is obviously set up more with a mind for comfort. It's a bit... But this isn't a sports car. It's a big off-roader. There's plenty of kit on board. We've got the 2.7 litre V6, which means you get leather upholstery, leather covered steering wheel, air conditioning, and all the gizmos you've come to expect in a big modern car. Of course, you can't spend your entire life posing up and down the high street and dropping the kids off at school. This is, after all, an off-roader. And once every 2,000 years or so, it might be called upon to venture out onto the bumpy stuff. So how's it do? been pretty much any of the modern rash of, I suppose, soft roaders is the word. Apart from this is quite a lot bigger than most of them. But it's coping pretty well with everything I throw at it. Really, all you need in any modern car to cope with this kind of stuff is a bit of extra ground clearance, which we have got here. And of course, four-wheel drive. Ordinary road driving circumstances, it's split 60% of the drive to the front, 40% to the rear, and then gradually it sorts the power out as and where it's needed when it starts getting a bit slippy. Speaking of which, there is a limited slip diff at the back, which is good news, giving a bit of extra grip to wheels as and when you need it. And yeah, it copes admirably well. Of course, back in the real world, it is actually going to spend the majority of its time at the kerb outside the wine bar. So it's really important that it looks right, does it? Garçon? Our friends at the Mystery Manufacturer have gone for the muscular look. It actually looks slightly longer than it wants to be, but not unpleasant. It is maybe a bit ungainly seen around the front end, just from some angles, but square on, it looks great and pretty unusual. There's something pretty road car mated to off-road car about this thing. It is a big old barge. It's longer and larger than the Honda CRV, the Toyota RAV4, Land Rover, Freelander, all of these. If anything, it's competing almost a class up, certainly on size. I told you it looked good. Well, the birds like it. Well, if you don't already know what it is, well, come with me and I'll show you. Here's a clue. Dig this tape off. It is called a Santa Fe. Ring any bells? Okay. Here's a bigger hint for you. It's made by, dig all this lot off, recognise the badge? Possibly, possibly not. Hyundai. So what, you might say? Well, there's the point of it, because just a few years ago, you would have said, 
Ah, I don't want one of those ever, thank you very much. They've done an awful lot to improve their brand image. And that explains a lot about the car. That explains why it's got these huge lumps over the front wheel arches that are taken directly from the coupe that has done so much to put Hyundai on the map as a sensible car maker. So let that be a lesson. Think about it next time. Don't be driven by the badge. Think about the metal. And in this case, you get quite a lot of it for not too much money. There are some things in life that are just downright annoying. People that turn up late, burnt toast, running out of toilet paper, and the fact that the Honda S2000 is a listless lump of metal until you hit 7,000 RPM. The Honda S2000 is an interesting proposition simply because it redlines at 9,000 RPM, which sounds an absolute hoot in theory, but in practice has its drawbacks. You see, there aren't too many roads in our country that lets you fully appreciate the wonderful six-speed gearbox or really get the most out of the naturally aspirated engine that pumps out 237 brake horsepower and can hit 60 in just under six seconds. And that's such a shame. You see, at law-abiding speeds, the Honda's engine feels motorcycle-like. Below 7,000 RPM, it actually feels, well, not unlike an MX-5. Those thrills that it promises really don't materialise. And while the engine does sound fantastic, it seems a pity that Honda's engineers haven't paid closer attention to the chassis and the steering. You can't put a finger on any particular fault. It's just that the whole dynamic performance leaves you a little wanting and wondering exactly what could have been. The first thing you notice about the interior is this Formula One style instrument panel that goes up to 9,000 revs. Apart from that, it's really a very Spartan affair in here. But that's okay because it means nothing gets in the way of the driving, which is what this car is all about. These snazzy red seats hold you in nice and tight. And there's a good deep seating position that makes you feel as if you're in a cockpit. That's enhanced by the high sides to the doors, the steering wheel, and this lovely little button that helps you start the engine. The hood is triggered by the flick of a button and six seconds is all it takes to raise or drop. Perfect for our British summertime. The S2000 was born out of the SSM concept that was unveiled at the 95 Tokyo Motor Show and it's truly stunning with its long bonnet and sharp line styling. A fitting birthday present from Honda to itself. The thing about a great sports car is that it should turn you on the minute you climb aboard and get better from that point on whatever speed you might be doing. And the problem with the S2000 is that you have to thrash it well beyond the speed limit to truly appreciate what it's capable of. And at £28,500, it seems like an awful lot of money just to lose your licence. It's been 10 years since Toyota launched the Lexus LS400, a car which shook the European luxury car makers to their socks. After all, Toyota was a mass market car maker and, the argument went, mass manufacturers just can't give a luxury model the degree of individual attention those buyers demand. Wrong. In fact, the LS400 was quieter, it was smoother, it was better air conditioned, it was better riding, and it was faster than all its rivals. The only thing it lacked was heritage and charisma, and that was something that all the money and engineering know-how that Toyota threw at the Lexus project just couldn't provide. Well, now there's a new Lexus, the LS430, and after 10 years of awesome success in the luxury field, well, perhaps Lexus has established its own charisma and heritage. Not that they've changed the appearance of the car that much. Lexus always had a bland, anonymous-looking front end, and that's carried over onto the new model. Lexus's engineers were obsessed with cutting CD values and wind noise, and that's resulted in the lowest CD value in the market segment. The new headlamps are rather 
in your face, you could say even ugly. But the appeal of the big Lexus to its discerning buyers was never on face value. They knew what lay under the skin. But it's inside the Lexus that the almost fanatical attention to detail and engineering excellence really shows. In things like the, the leather trim, the perfect Californian wood, the brushed aluminium, and this wonderful instrument panel that lights up from virtual reality and which created such a stir with the first LS400. The list of extras just goes on and on and on. There's a door closer system, oh, yeah. no more slam and doors, doors that fold in. Yes, the front seat switch is switchable between sport and high There's mode. electric memory Rear passenger Rear controls for the with a fiber system. Massage and and air system fitted as standard. The CD auto changer, yeah. electrically multi adjustable swing front seat, in the front with four way window blind. Support. Rear view mirrors dip it's for the LCD to adjust touch the front screen and the dashboard. steering column electrically adjusts. And it's fitted with the most sophisticated hi-fi system you've ever seen. Designed by Mark Levinson, well-known Californian manufacturer of incredibly expensive hi-fi systems. Now, in the past, he would never put a system in a car. But in the Lexus, he thought it was uh, calm enough and quiet enough in the cabin for you to really appreciate one of his systems. Let's see if he's right. Well, after a few miles, you have to say he was right. It really is uncannily quiet in here. You can't hear the engine. There's very little noise coming back from road surface or bumps and thumps. You really do rather want the radio or the CD on to block out the eerie silence. Now, 4.3 litres, the V8 churns out over 280 horsepower and a stonking 417 torque figure push your foot down and a computer that the press release describes as a brain the size of a small planet surges the car away with seamless gear changes until you suddenly notice you're doing instant disqualification speeds without even knowing how you got there. And if you were unlucky enough to hit anything, well, a plethora of airbags explode from literally every corner of the car to make sure that you and your precious occupants remain unhurt. It doesn't roll or pitch. The increased wheelbase give it even more stability over the old model. The steering is absolutely pin sharp. You can place this car to an inch and the traction with the big fat tyres is really extremely good. You can't get over the fact that it's a big heavy limousine but even so you can hustle it along at really surprising speeds on these country lanes. You have to say, this LS430 really is a truly great car. and It's a notable step forward from the old LS400. It's still relatively bland and innocuous, but that's what people who buy these big Lexuses like. They don't want to advertise their wealth with a three-pointed star, a flying lady, or even a leaping cat on the bonnet. They're people who value their creature comforts for what they are and not for what they represent to other people. Sounds a silly thing to say, but at £50,000 or thereabouts, this Lexus is great value, especially when you compare it to the price of what used to be called the best car in the world. It was in the 1980s when we saw the amazing phenomenon which is the company car really take off. Travelling around the country for sales reps became the norm and they wanted a car which was comfortable, reliable and had a hook in the back to hang their jackets on. In 1982, Ford launched their, at the time, very radical Sierra. Vauxhall had no match for it. They had the original shape Cavalier. So they responded in 1988 with their new Cavalier. Whilst the Cavalier may not be the epitome of style and grace, it does a job and does it very well. And that's the car that we're looking at this week. Now, most Cavaliers have at some stage in their lives been company cars, and so they've been generally well looked after. 
fancy this? Well, it's a 1.8 LS, five-door automatic, done a high mileage over 90,000 miles, but it could be yours for less than 2,000 pounds. And because it's been a company car in the past, it's got a full service record to go with it. Comfortable, reliable, inexpensive to run. This 1.8 LS model gets alloys, power steering, electric windows, central locking, and a glass sunroof. It's roomy for passengers, and it gets a decent boot. Cars like this, which have spent much of their lives tracking up and down motorways, will inevitably have a bonnet full of stone chips, and this one's certainly no different, as you can see here. But it's relatively easy and cheap to sort them out with some touch-up paint. is probably the most difficult part because there are so many different models, engines and special editions to choose from. Engine wise, well you've got petrol starting with the underpowered 1.4 which we wouldn't recommend to the 2.5 V6 which we would. There are also 1.7 turbo diesel options to choose from as well. So here's a few ideas of prices for a Cavalier. A 1.6 Envoy K reg with 73,000 miles for £2,000. The top of the range 2 litre CDX fully loaded. We've seen a 50,000 mile car on an M plate for less than 4,000. Or perhaps, in our view, the best of the bunch, the 2 litre SRI, fast and looks good. An L reg with 65,000 miles should cost two and a half thousand pounds. OK, the Cavalier might not be the car that Formula One race drivers would choose to own, but for you and me, it's perfectly adequate. Perhaps the car's biggest letdown is the chassis, which makes the car feel rather stodgy and vague on fast country roads. Vauxhall also attempted in 1993 to go down the boy racer route when they introduced the Cavalier 4x4 Turbo. In reality, it didn't catch on and was dropped after a year. And on the used car market, those are probably the ones to avoid because anything that goes wrong is likely to be costly. Now, clocking can be a big problem on the Cavaliers, so look out for the telltale signs like excessive wear on the steering wheel, the seats and the pedals. If you're unsure about the car, simply walk away because there are plenty more to choose from. Next week on Motor Week, Ken Gibson will be testing the BMW X8 head-on with the BMW X5. And Glenda Mackay's back, she'll be driving the Mercedes CL600.